those peeping toms come in uninvited, force their way into your homes. Yep, through your computer. Somehow they find an open door, back door way in, and bam. Next thing you know, bank passcodes don't work anymore, phone is locked, email passwords have been changed. You are in a frantic panic state. The worst is going through your mind, and it's happened. I didn't eat that. The fastest growing crime in America, and every 14 seconds there's a new victim. The question is, will the next victim be you? I'm proud to be in partner with today's sponsor, Aura. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all combined into one easy-to-use app. A win-win. You can beat those digital peeping toms quick and right away with Aura. Protect your family and yourself from identity theft with Aura. Join the 14-day free trial at www.aura.com forward slash SIBO and SNAPA. Of the 19th century, radically different cultures could develop and persist during this era before transportation and communication developed <laughs> to the point of promoting widespread interactions among people in different regions. In colonial America, the people of the English borderlands and of the Celtic fringe were seen by contemporaries as culturally quite distinct and were socially unwelcome. Mob action prevented a shipload of Ulster Scots from landing in Boston in 1719, and the Quaker leaders of eastern Pennsylvania encouraged Ulster Scots to settle out in western Pennsylvania, where they acted as a buffer to the Indians, as well as being a constant source of friction and conflict with the Indians. It was not just in the north that crackers and rednecks were considered to be undesirables. Mm. Southern plantation owners with poor whites living on adjoining land would often offer to buy their land for more than it was worth in order to be rid of such neighbors. Wow. Because there were no racial differences to form separate statistical categories for these North Britons and for other whites who settled in the South, or in particular enclaves elsewhere, direct indicators must serve as proxies for these cultural differences. Names are among these indicators. Edward, for example, was a popular name in Virginia and in Wessex, England, from which many Virginians had emigrated. But the first 40 classes of undergraduates at Harvard College contained only one man named Edward. It would be nearly two centuries before Harvard enrolled anyone named Patrick, even though that was a common name in western Pennsylvania where the Ulster Scots settled. This says something not only about the social and geographic differences of the times, but also about how regionalized the naming patterns were then, in contrast to the fact that no one today finds it particularly strange when an Asian American has such non-Asian first names as Kevin or Michelle. Even where there was no conflict or hostility involved, Southerners often showed a reckless disregard for human life, including their own. For example, the racing of steamboats that happened to encounter each other on the rivers of the South often ended with exploding boilers, especially when the excited competition led to the tying down of safety valves in order to build up more pressure to generate more speed. An impromptu race between steamboats that encountered each other on the Mississippi. See, some information, I, I want him to go just keep moving, staying in the context of... Um, I guess it's Black American culture and Ebonic, so I guess it's just giving you the the details. Because I'm gonna keep on hitting that meat. The Southern grass is always a little bit greener. Steamboats shaved and cut. How fast can steamboats really go? Steamboats illustrates the pattern. <laughs> on board one boat was an old lady who, having bought a winter stock of bacon, pork, etc was returning to her home on the banks of the eat. Mississippi. She was about to eat. Fun lovers on board both boats insisted upon a race. Cheers and drawn pistols obliged the captains to cooperate. As the boats struggled to outdistance each other, excited passengers demanded more speed. Despite every effort, the boats raced evenly until the old lady directed her slaves to throw all her casks of bacon into the boilers. Uh-uh. Her boat. Hey, boy! <laughs> Cook the bacon. But look, those boats are humongous. How can they even go fast? Why would you try to race that? And they cooking bacon. Ooh, I bet it smell good in the <laughs> air. <laughs> it's probably a lot of bacon in the, in the fire to make the boat go faster. Oh my gosh, it was still cooking. Like, mm. Man. This ride makes me hungry. That's crazy. Um, 
aircraft, then moved ahead of the other vessel, which suddenly exploded. Clouds of splinters and human limbs darkened the sky. On the undamaged boat, passengers shouted their victory. But above their cheers could be heard the shrill voice of the old lady, crying, I did it! I did it! It's all my bacon! On the Mississippi and other western rivers of the United States, as it existed in the early 19th century, it has been estimated that 30% of all the steamboats were lost in accidents. Part of this may have been due to deficiencies in the early steamboats themselves, but much of it was due to the recklessness with which they were operated on southern rivers. Right. I ain't get on nothing that looked like a, a vintage house on water. But that is crazy. Why would you try to race something that big and slow? How fast is that something like that going to actually go all that way? Put the bacon in it. Put the bacon in it. The comments of a fireman on a Mississippi steamboat of that era may suggest why a river voyage was considered more dangerous than crossing the Atlantic at a time when sinkings in the Atlantic were by no means rare. Mm. Talk about northern steamers, the fireman of a Mississippi steamboat sneered to an eastern traveler in 1844. It don't need no spunk to navigate them waters. You ain't bust a biler in five years. Mm. But I tell you, stranger, it takes a man to ride one of these half alligator boats, head on a snag, wow. high pressures, valve soldered down, 600 souls on board, and Ooh. in danger of going to the devil. Mm. This was no mere idle talk. Among the steamboat explosions in the South, one on the Mississippi in 1838 killed well over 100 people and wow. another near Baton Rouge in 1859 killed more than half of the 400 people on board from and badly injured more than half the survivors. Southerners were just as reckless on land, whether in escapades undertaken for the excitement of the moment or in the many fights. Look, hence how they got, he got the, the, the dining table all busted back there. Y'all ain't seeing the details. But I, I'm going to need you to land your plane. <laughs> he do that. He do <laughs> He's that. going. Oh, okay. Bring it. I'm. I'm listening. But I guess you know what. Full this is, circle. But this is technically this is. You know, I take that back. That's Tom Sawyer. He's just reading reading Tom Sawyer's writing. Okay. Fights and deaths resulting from some insult or a slight among people touchy about their honor and dignity. Again. All of this went back to a way of life in the turbulent regions of Britain from which white Southerners came. Nor is it hard to recognize in these attitudes Crip. clear parallels oh, to the behavior and attitudes of ghetto gangs today ghetto who kill gang. over a look or a word blue. or any action Good. that can be construed as dissing them. Pride had yet another side to it. Among the definitions of a cracker in the Oxford Dictionary is a braggart, one who talks trash in today's vernacular, <laughs> a wisecracker. More than mere wisecracks were involved, oh, wisecracker. The pattern is one said by Professor McWhiney to go back to descriptions of ancient Celts. Oh, uh -huh, yo! Yeah. <laughs> the uh, Simpsons. Huh, yeah, it is the, the Simpsons. Simpsons. The Simpsons. As boasters and threateners, and given to bombastic self-dramatization. Mm -mm. Examples today come readily to mind, not only from ghetto life and gangsta rap, but also from militant black leaders, spokesmen, or activists. What is painfully ironic is that such attitudes and behavior are projected today as aspects of a distinctive black identity, when in fact, they are part of a centuries-old pattern among the whites in whose midst generations of blacks lived in the South. Wow. Whoa. Any broad brush discussion of cultural patterns must, of course, not claim that all people, whether white or black, had the same culture much less to the same degree. There are not only Pull changes over. over time, there are cross currents at any given time. Nevertheless, it is useful to see the outlines of a general pattern, even when that pattern erodes over time and at varying rates among different subgroups. I wonder that's how we, sometimes I wonder that's how God looking at us, look at all these little moving ants down here. The violence for which white Southerners became most lastingly notorious was lynching. Like other aspects of the redneck and cracker culture, it has often been attributed to race or slavery. In but finding out that that's not necessarily true. We think lynching, we think black people, but they, white people got lynched too. Black people, white people. Every, but in the South, it was, I think it was more put up for public display. But everybody was getting... Every, 
blacks and whites were getting lynched. I would sure like to know the statistics no, of Candace blacks Owens talked about c- compared to whites getting lynched. Mm-hmm. I-, I would. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. In fact, however, most lynching victims in the antebellum South were white. Economic considerations alone would prevent a slave owner from lynching his own slave wow. or tolerating anyone else's doing so. It was only after the Civil War that the emancipated blacks became the principal targets of lynching. Mm. But by then, Southern wow. vigilante violence had been a tradition Wait for a more than Stop a century back. in North. Go back to what he just said. But by then, Southern vigilante, however, most lynching victims in the antebellum South were white. Economic considerations alone would prevent a slave owner from lynching his own slave or tolerating anyone else's doing so. Okay. so that, that was it was only after the Civil War that the emancipated blacks became the principal targets of lynching. Mm. But by then, Southern vigilante violence had been a tradition for more than a century in North America and even longer back in the regions of Britain from which crackers and rednecks came, Mm. where retributive justice was often left in private hands. Even the burning cross of the Ku Klux Klan has been traced back to the fiery cross of old Scotland, used by feuding clans. Mm. Observers of the white population of the antebellum South often commented not only on their poverty, but also on their lack of industriousness or entrepreneurship. A contemporary characterized many white Southerners as too poor to keep slaves and too proud to work. A landmark history of agriculture in the antebellum South described the poor whites this way. They cultivated in a casual and careless fashion small patches of corn or rice, sweet potatoes, cow peas, and garden products. Women and children did a large part of the work. The men spent their time principally in hunting or idleness, The men were inveterate drunkards, and sometimes the women joined them in drinking inferior whiskey. Hmm. Licentiousness was prevalent among them. Among their equals, the men were quarrelsome and inclined to crimes of violence. The poor whites were densely ignorant. Their labors tended to be intermittent, often when they were pressed for money rather than a steady employment career. Frederick Law Olmsted called it lazy poverty with whatever work they did being done in a thoughtless manner. Hmm. Summarizing his observations in the antebellum South, Olmsted said, I know that while men seldom want an abundance of coarse food in the cotton states, the proportion of the free white men who live as well in any aspect as our working classes in the North, on an average, is small, and that the citizens of the cotton states, as a whole, are poor. They work little, and that little, badly. They earn little, They sell little, Mm. they buy little, and they have little, Mm. very little, of the common comforts and consolations of civilized life. Their destitution is not material only. It is intellectual, and it is moral. That's that's the curse, ain't it? The curse. I mean, it's like they didn't want want nothing no better. They were okay with... Exactly. So people... Below average. People were thinking like, they just held you down. No, no, we got to a point where we'll just, that's all we wanted. Dang. But it started back there with them, though. That's what I'm saying. With them. Them. Who was yeah. them? Well, who is he talking about? He's talking about the rednecks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 